I think the first wave of attacks would have been hypersonic missiles launched against targets in Europe that are NATO and U.S. targets. Everything from Ramstein Air Base to uh, Grafenvir to any number of uh, uh, you know supply depots, railheads, and, and other aerodromes where aircraft can be assembled for use against Russia. So I think that's what you would have seen, not nuclear weapons initially, but hypersonic missiles. And of course, we can't shoot them down. They're coming in at roughly 5,000 uh, miles per hour or more. So there's no defense against them. Secretary, uh, The Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, has been a go-along, get-along guy. He really hasn't raised strenuous objections to very much. But it's possible. Uh, I certainly know that senior officers in the Air Force and, and the Army, I know absolutely have raised questions about the wisdom of this. And it probably pointed out what you just said, that we have no defense against these hypersonic missiles. Greetings, dear viewers. We are, we are pleased to welcome you back to today's program. A new day and a series of burning geopolitical developments await us. As Colonel Douglas Magar, a respected military strategist Radich, recently pointed out, the situation in Ukraine and Russia's nuclear doctrine have far-reaching implications that can reshape global power dynamics. The latest information from the Ukraine battlefield and more importantly, significant adjustments in Russia's nuclear doctrine could change the global political landscape. As you may know, Russia recently tested the Sarmat missile, a strategic nuclear weapon system capable of striking targets at extreme distances. However, the test is reported to have been unsuccessful. But let me remind you, Russia's actions did not stop with just a missile test. They have conducted a series of tactical nuclear missile drills, particularly alongside Belarus, a clear demonstration of Russia's readiness should the geopolitical scenario worsen. What we're witnessing isn't just isolated events, but a complete shift in Russia's approach and adaptation and a firm response to the world's current situation. But that's just the beginning, dear viewers. We need to dive deeper into the recent changes in Russia's nuclear doctrine, something that will directly impact not only the West, but the entire course of the war in Ukraine. Let's break down each aspect of this doctrine. First, let's analyze the core points of Russia's new nuclear doctrine. As Colonel Douglas Magar has frequented someone, Dysos, this doctrine is a fundamental shift that must be understood in the context of Russia's strategic goals. This is important because it's not just a declaration, it's a way for Russia to reshape its strategic thinking regarding the rest of the world. But the first point, if Russia pursues an attack from space aimed at its territory, they will immediately retaliate with the nuclear weapons. This isn't new, but it reaffirms Russia's commitment to defending its airspace from increasingly present threats. In today's age, space is no longer a distant frontier, it's a real part of the battlefield, and Russia is making it clear that they are prepared to defend it. But secondly, Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons if their ally Belarus is attacked. This is a strong commitment, and with recent developments, it's clear that the bond between Russia and Belarus has never been tighter. This means that an attack on Belarus will no longer be just an internal issue for that country. It will be seen as an attack on Russia itself. Thirdly, if Russia's sovereignty is severely threatened even by conventional weapons, Russia reserves the right to use nuclear weapons. What's interesting here is the ambiguity around the term severe. Russia has the full authority to define what severe means, creating a gray area that no other country can fully predict. This uncertainty makes dealing with Russia far more complex. Lastly, if a nuclear have a nuclear power or a country possessing nuclear weapons aids an enemy attacking Russia, this too will be a legitimate reason for Russia to respond with nuclear force. This is a clear warning to Western countries, especially the US and the NATO, who have continuously provided Ukraine with long-range weapons and advanced systems. Russia is directly targeting Western involvement here, and this could pave the way for even stronger reactions if the situation intensifies. These points are not just theoretical concepts, but practical actions, and their impact will be felt directly on the Ukrainian battlefield. Now let's take a closer look at the latest developments on the ground. As Colonel Douglas McGregor has noted in his military analysis, the situation on the Ukrainian battlefield is rapidly deteriorating for Ukrainian for Indian forces. The current situation is extremely intense with no signs of slowing down. According to the latest reports we have gathered, in just one day, Ukrainian forces have suffered catastrophic losses. 2,390 personnel have been removed from combat. Yes, the exact figure is 2,390, but if we round up, we can say that 2,400 soldiers were lost within just 24 hours. This is an unimaginable loss, and it shows the ferocity of the fighting taking place right now. In Bakhmut, one of the hottest spots in this war, Ukraine has lost 835 soldiers in a single day. This number is higher than on any other day in this conflict, even exceeding the 820 soldiers we saw earlier. 
This is a new record in the history of this conflict. Surrounding areas like Kostiantinivka, Charsivyar, Pokrovsk, and Yarl become fiercely contested battlefields where every inch of ground is ground is paid for with blood. Furthermore, in the Kursk region, while personnel losses appear lighter than in other areas, Ukraine has still lost 300 soldiers in just one day. This is a significant loss compared to other days, and with such numbers, it's clear that Ukrainian forces are gradually regressors. Um, we are not just talking about manpower, but also about equipment. Ukraine has lost a large number of military assets. Among them are four heavy armored vehicles, three tanks, two artillery pieces, and various other vehicles. In Kursk, while there are fewer vehicles lost, the number of tanks destroyed is higher than on previous days, indicating that Ukraine is being forced to use heavier equipment, though still failing to achieve the desired outcome. 12 heavy combat armored vehicles have been destroyed, which is a fairly large number, half of what we saw on previous days. The number of tanks destroyed is six higher than usual, signaling that Ukraine's offensive capabilities are being severely hampered. So, ladies and gentlemen, the intensity of Ukraine's offensive has decreased to a bare minimum on many fronts. This reflects not only a depletion in manpower, but also shows that Ukraine's ability to maintain its campaign is under serious threat. And the losses are not just in manpower. Ukraine's military equipment and vehicles are also suffering heavy damage. We'll delve deeper into the decline of Ukraine's combat capabilities through the next set of data. Ladies and gentlemen, we talk about military equipment. We must highlight Ukraine's clear failures in this area. In just one day, they have lost 12 heavy combat armored vehicles. That is a significant number compared to the previous weeks. In addition, Six tanks have been destroyed, including two Leopard tanks, the modern battle tanks that the West had such high hopes for, expecting them to turn the tide of the battlefield. These Leopard tanks were involved in an attack near Glushkovo in the Kursk region, but the result was their destruction with no significant tactical gain for Ukraine. Day by day, we are seeing more clearly that the modern weaponry supplied by the West, despite being highly praised, still cannot withstand the defensive power of Russia. The number of armored vehicles destroyed shows not only a strategic failure, but also that Ukraine no longer has the capability to sustain offensive power as they once did. But that's not all. 39 artillery pieces have been destroyed, including four self-propelled guns, two rocket artillery systems, and notably two vampire rocket systems weapons used in attacks on civilian areas near Russia's borders, like Belgorod. Sadly, these attacks have caused little harm to Russia while further draining Ukraine's vital artillery systems. This is a clear indication that Ukraine's long-range strike strategy is gradually losing its effectiveness. With these losses, the question arises, can Ukraine continue to launch offensives? We'll analyze more about their overall strategy next. The dear viewers, as we look at the overall battle, it is clear that's keen that Ukraine is losing its ability to both defend and attack. As Colonel Douglas Magrath's point has pointed out, Ukraine is facing an increasingly difficult situation with its resources being stretched to the limit. Besides Bakhmut, with 835 soldiers lost in a single day, we see that in Kherson, only 30 soldiers are left to fight. This number is incredibly low, almost rendering them incapable of sustaining any large-scale offensive. Other regions like Kharkiv and Kupiansk are also seeing severe reductions in their forces, with approximately 100 to 300 soldiers being lost every day. This isn't just a sign of fatigue, it's a clear weakening of Ukraine's ability to command and fight. It's evident that they are pausing to reorganize, but the bigger question is, do they still have enough resources to continue? With such continuous losses in manpower, it's hard to imagine that Ukraine can maintain the high intensity of acts as they once did. With this critical situation, Ukraine's long range strike strategy is also facing major challenges. Let's continue analyzing that next. Um, Ukraine continues to try to sustain missile strikes, especially with Emmers targeting Russian controlled areas. But dear viewers, what have we seen? These strikes for the most part seem to be more about political effect than about more analysis a recent example is the Himhar's attack on a Russian convoy, but the result. Only a few vehicles destroyed, not significant compared to the initial expectations. Ukraine has been trying to convince the West that they can still maintain an offensive, but battlefield data tells a different story. Russian air defenses have intercepted many of these attacks, and it's becoming clear that Ukraine is struggling to keep up its long-range strike strategy. With this strategy not delivering the desired results, the next question is how has Russia progressed on the battlefield? Finally, dear viewers, Russia continues to move forward. Recently, we have witnessed significant progress in the regions of Ostro and Grivorka. These are important areas that have been liberated by Russian forces, and this demonstrates their ability to maintain the upper hand across the battlefield. Not only that, Russia has destroyed 12 ammunition depots belonging to Ukraine, including AOV production plant and a central radio control system. 
These blows have targeted Ukraine's command and logistical centers, making it much harder for them to organize large-scale counterattacks in the near future. Russia's air defense systems have also been highly effective, shooting down 14 Mars rounds and several other rockets. This is a clear sign that Russia is not just defending, but also maintaining strong offensive capabilities. In the days to come, will Ukraine continue to suffer more losses? We will continue to provide updates. As Colonel Douglas McGregor recently summarized, the situation is increasingly becoming more difficult for Ukraine. It is clear that the losses in manpower, equipment, and strategy all show that Russia is maintaining the upper hand on the battlefield, with the recent adjustments in its nuclear doctrine. Russia is not just adapting, but also sending a powerful message to the West and NATO. Because Ukraine, on the other hand, is gradually running out of resources. And the big question here is how much longer can they sustain this war? We will continue to monitor the situation and provide you with the latest information in our upcoming broadcast. Thank you for watching. Um